Get full episodes of The Damage Report as a podcast on iTunes and Android, and you can watch the live show every weekday on YouTube TV. The swearing in of not only the new speaker, but also the new house has happened. And we now have democratic control of the house, which is no small thing. Speaking for myself personally, I've already moved on and I want more, but it is big, it is major. And it means that in all likelihood, 2019 is going to be the worst year of Donald Trump's life, which will be great for those of us who have been experiencing the last couple of years. Um, but I wanna start off on a good note, not just schadenfreude. Um, we have some good news. Let's bring up this first uh, graphic showing some of the new uh, members of Congress that are being sworn in. There you see Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ayanna Presley, and Omar, others as well, uh, showcasing not only that this is the most female house that we've ever had, but it's also uh, racially diverse as well, which is awesome, diverse in terms of sexual orientation uh, too. Uh, if we go to this next graphic, you're gonna see, uh, you know, we just have to accept, like Ilhan Omar tweeted out, uh, my father and I greeting friends, family, and supporters who traveled across the country to share this special moment with us. I mean, how amazing is that? And I saw she tweeted out a photo yesterday. Uh, it was her walking with her father through an airport, and she said, "This is the same airport." Oh my God, I'm like getting a little bit choked up. Uh, that we walked through when we first came to this country, and I think 19 years later, her father was accompanying her to be sworn in as the first Somali American ever elected to the Congress. Like, how amazing is that? Other good stuff going on too, just interesting historical note, Rashida Tlaib is gonna be sworn in on Thomas Jefferson's Quran, which is both amazing historically and also will cause many right wing heads to simply explode. There's gonna be a house rule change that will allow Ilan Omar to to wear a veil in in uh, the House as well, so you know, big changes in terms of diversity, and we, we have a, a Congress that looks more like America. Finally, uh, interesting historical note too, though. I saw Ryan Strook on uh, Twitter. He tweeted out some stats. So, did you know that back in 1989, uh, of all of the people in the House, uh, there were 16 Democratic women, there were 13 Republican women. So that's uh, 29 women in the House. Bear in mind, there are hundreds in the House uh, back in 1989. So 16 Democrats, 13 Republicans. And uh, you know, flash forward, uh, was it 30 years? Big changes actually, 89 Democrats. So a much higher number, still not representative, but much higher. You know how the Republicans are doing? 13. They have not gotten one additional raw woman member of their caucus in 30 years. And I know I saw um, these numbers were going around in New York, New York Times and all of that, and they're trying to work it out. They're trying to, why is that? Why is it that more women aren't running and women and winning as Republicans? And I don't think it's as complicated as they think it is. I mean, first of all, if you're a woman, you're probably a little bit less likely to be a Republican in the first place. You also probably buy into quite a bit of the Republican rhetoric about the role of women in society, in the home, all of that. So you're probably less likely to run. If you're a Republican voter, you certainly seem less likely to vote for a woman. I mean, you could ask in polls, do you think it would be a good thing if we ever had a female president? And it seems like the sort of thing where how could you say no? And yet a significant chunk of Americans generally, to be fair, say no, but a higher percentage of Republicans say it. So can we really be that shocked that there's not that many Republican women in Congress? Um, but anyway, good improvements for the Democrats, uh, absolutely terrible for the Republicans. But what does this all mean in terms of what we'll actually get and what we won't get in the new year? Because it is good news, but it's not universally good news. So you know, let's start off with the bad news. This is a damage report after all. So here are some of the things that do not change even though we were successful in getting the house. If something happens with the Supreme Court and another spot opens up, this new Democratic House effectively doesn't change anything about that. It is likely that Donald Trump will still be able to nominate anyone he wants, you know, ideologically in terms of their history of potentially assaulting people. He can nominate whoever he wants, and he's probably gonna get that person. That doesn't change, unfortunately. In terms of our ability to actually pass legislation, effectively nothing has changed. Now, strategically, that does not mean that legislation shouldn't be put forward, that we shouldn't be pushing for big, bold responses to the problems that we face. But in terms of actually passing it, you still have a Republican Senate, you still have a Republican president. So we have to bear in mind that having one branch of government or one sub branch of government is great. Having lots of them is far better. And so bear that in mind in the future. Like as much as, so I want 
Bernie Sanders as president or another progressive as president. But I also understand that if along the way we don't do what is necessary to take control of the Senate and keep control of the House, it will be great to have him as president, but not quite as consequential as if he will actually be able to pass legislation. Uh, taking control of the Supreme Court would also be good for that same reason. Now, there is good though, there are good things that we can expect from this. So. Uh, the ability of the Republicans to pass another round of absolutely massive tax cuts has been significantly curtailed. Now, I wouldn't put it past some of the Democrats to vote for some form of tax cuts, potentially, although there's gonna be a lot of pressure on them not to do so. But the idea that they're going to massively drop the corporate tax rate again or the rates on the 1%, things like that, like they did last year, that seems far less likely now that we have this Democratic House majority. Huge cuts to Medicare and Social Security, which are not hypothetical, by the way. These are things that Paul Ryan was very much talking up throughout last year that they were planning to do in 2019 if they maintain their House majority. That is now out the door, that is not going to happen. Um, let's see, destroying the ACA, they tried back in 2017. They were defeated thanks to a couple of Republicans turning uh, you know, in the Senate. Uh, that now is not going to happen. The idea that we're gonna get rid of the ACA, you know, aside from the Supreme Court potentially destroying it, that's still possible. But in Congress, that is not going to happen. That is not a small thing either. And I will just say other legislation. Because honestly, as much as I pay attention to media, as much as I have now been in this career for you know six or seven years or whatever, I can't necessarily predict what god awful legislation they would have passed if they had maintained their control of the House. I mean, I wouldn't have predict, predicted going into 2018 that they'd be caging babies, but they came up with that. So now with the House controlled by the Democrats, we have a bulwark against all of those insane priorities that they had already made progress on previously and certainly would have pushed for uh, more in the future, so that is good, but not everything is great. So while we have all these new House members being sworn in, we also have Nancy Pelosi, who is not the worst person who could be Speaker, certainly. But it frustrates me to a great degree that even questioning the possibility of having someone else was considered like like saying Lord Voldemort out loud. Like, how can you possibly not support? Like, yes, yeah, she was the she was the Speaker before. Uh, she's uh, very experienced inside of the caucus. That's not the only things you want in a speaker necessarily. And I feel like we could have had a more robust discussion about that. And in terms of what she has actually done, in terms of setting her priorities now that she is going to be speaker again. I mean, we talked yesterday about Pago. That is not a good sign for how she actually plans to rule as head of the House once again. And I am frustrated that more haven't come forward to say that they're gonna vote against that rules package. We, and you and you in the audience, we put pressure on people yesterday, hoping that some would, 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 Hear that and do the right thing. And as of right now, I believe on the record we have the same two we had yesterday. That's AOC and Rokana. We have others saying, you know, that they're still thinking about it, but not 18. Not 18 and not close to 18, unfortunately. And some people like we, we talked about yesterday on the Young Turks, Representative Pramila Jayapal, the head of the progressives in Congress, who's been on the show previously, she is now coming out and saying why she thinks that it will be okay if those rules go into effect. And look, I trust her on the issues, I trust her ideologically, but I do still question this. Now, look, we laid out why Pago is terrible in the show yesterday. But we are also, this is not a program that, that sort of barters in the simplistic. And you know, people who are both for it and against it have, have talked about it in ridiculously oversimplified terms. We don't do that here, but it is still bad, even if it is not a barrier that cannot be overcome, it's still bad. Now, yes. Exemptions have been carved out, Pramila Jayapal and others have been talking about that on Twitter. So in terms of Medicare for all, which by the way, hearings are in the process of being scheduled for, that is no small thing too, that right off the bat, we're getting into discussion of one of the biggest policy priorities, that is huge. And apparently exemptions have been created for that and other left positions. So that is good, assuming that their word is actually worth something in house leadership and that will remain to be seen, we'll be watching them obviously. But it shouldn't be there to begin with. Some of the other rules changes are fine. I'm totally in favor of them. There's no reason that Pago needs to be one of them. Now, there are added wrinkles, and just really fast. So even if it wasn't part of the House rules, it is still law. That is true. So defeating it in the House doesn't mean that we would not have to defeat it in terms of law. And Pramila Jayapal is saying that she and others are gonna put forward legislation to get rid of it. We will see if that is able to pass. I don't understand why the Republicans in the Senate would support it. So likely we will be in as bad of a situation later on as we are now in terms of that. And yes, a House majority can vote to overrule Pago for particular pieces of legislation. 
which hopefully will provide an out. And I, I guess objectively, if you can't get a majority to vote for overruling it, you probably can't get a majority to vote for it in the first place. These are all things that we're going to be on the lookout for. But going into the new year with this as one of the major rules changes is not a good sign. And so as much as I would like to be able to say, hey, new house, new year, new reality, no, our job continues, the struggle continues, regardless of which side of the camera that you're on, regardless of whether you're in the house or you're trying to push them to do the right thing. Thank you very much for watching this clip from the damage report. If you liked it, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and ring the bell on YouTube to get notifications of our new videos. And of course, you can catch the full damage report live every weekday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific on TYT Network on YouTube TV.